Hello, this is Felice Darco. I'm a pediatric neuroradiologist in um, uh, London, Great Ormond Street Hospital and Evelina Children Hospital. And I will be speaking to, today about imaging of orbital masses in children. And I would like to thank you, the organizer, for the invite. Um, my presentation are on YouTube. So um, if you want, uh, uh, if you are interested, please uh, uh, check out my uh, channel. Uh, let's start uh, uh, the presentation, and uh, this will be uh, this is the outline of the talk. It will be a case-based presentation divided in three parts, and in each part, I will focus on the differential diagnosis, um, uh, so the radiological element that will allow you to do the right uh, diagnosis in most of the cases. Um, first of all, uh, though, uh, as everything happens in radiology, you need to do the right sequences depending on what part, part of the uh, body you are studying. In this case, remember that we are studying the orbits. The orbits are full of fat and fluid. Uh, so the fluid is in the globe, the fat is in the um, orbital cone. And as in the other region of the head and neck, we do um, um, we need um, T2 fat saturated because as in this case, if we will have a mass, uh, this will need to be distinguished from the physiological hyper intense uh, fat. Uh, and uh, we need also fat saturated post contrast T1 uh, because a mass will enhance in most of the cases. The, act, the pre contrast T1 will be, however, not fat saturated because we need to see the mass which will be, uh, or the lesion that will be most likely hypo intense, uh, um, surrounded by the physiologically hyper intense fat. So in this case, we use the fat as a passive. Uh, uh, contrast. And of course, we need diffusion. So remember, axial T2 and post contrast only T1 need to be fat saturated when imaging the orbits. Um, I will start with vascular lesion and vascular tumors involving the orbits. And I will show you again element for differential diagnosis, but also please use the correct nomenclature. It's very, very important. Sometimes there are some mistakes in literature. So you need to use the right names for the right entities. There is not such a things like a curvy unicorn. The same applies to vascular lesion, vascular tumor in the uh, head and neck region and the orbit in particular. Look at this case. This is a 12 week female and uh, um, we have some asymmetry in the orbit. So the lesion is on the right. So the first thing you need to, uh, and this is the diffusion. The first thing you need to ask yourself and I will ask you several times um, uh, during this presentation to think about that is uh, uh, what are the radiological characteristics of this lesion? And also remember to look everything included in your field of view, including uh, outside the orbit. So in this case, there is something else with very similar radiological characteristics in the right cheek. So what are the uh, radiological characteristics? This mass enhances, look at the T1 post with fat saturation, and so intermediate signal in T2, but most importantly, there are some tubular hypo-intense areas in the uh, in both the mass. And the diffusion here is not as important as in the brain tumor, but I will come to that later. In this case, we will call it intermediate diffusion. So it's a well-defined homogeneously intense, uh, um, a, a homogeneously enhancing mass with internal flow void, meaning vessel, with relatively free diffusion. So now for you, what is the diagnosis? And you will have 30 seconds from now. Is this an infantile hemangioma? Is a venous malformation, a venolymphatic malformation, or an EVM? Please uh, uh, try to answer. Um, and uh, then I, I will comment uh, uh, in the chat box about the, the, the answer. Again, think about what are the radiological characteristics of the mass. Okay, 30 seconds passed. And uh, uh, this is just to show you that in the head and neck region, including the orbits, we are lucky because everywhere the, the, these different mass will have the similar characteristics. So whenever you are able to identify one specific entity in one part of the head and neck region, orbit or outside the orbit, you will be able to do the same diagnosis 
again and again. And this is again a mass that is well defined, homogeneously enhancing with internal flow void and free diffusion. So the right answer was infantile mangioma in this case and in the previous case. So these are the characteristics of an infantile hemangioma. But remember the internal vessel in this enhancing mass. And also remember that clinically the infantile hemangioma will have uh, uh, will increase over time for a few months and then progressively um, uh, um, encounter a fatty degenerative phase. Another uh, child with another lesion in the left orbit. And uh, again, you need to ask yourself what are the radiological characteristics of this um, uh, mass. And here I pointed the, the, the location of, the, of this lesion, and I pointed the location here of this, again, flow void. So again, this is an orbital mass in a very young child with internal flow void. This is the um, uh, uh, post contrast one fat saturated. Please note that in this case, in order to see better the flow voids, uh, whoever did the scan did also this unusual pre-T1 uh, fat saturated images. Uh, sometimes you can play a bit with the sequence. I will show another example when this is useful. So uh, again, look at this area, flow voids, uh, um, uh, abnormality, proptosis, which is very non-specific, but common sign. So again, think what is the diagnosis. So what is the diagnosis? It is another kind of infantile mangioma, is a venous malformation, a venolymphatic malformation, or is an ADM. And again, you will have about 30 seconds for now. Think about the description I've done regarding the infantile mangioma and try to see if the lesion I just show you uh, is um, a fitting this definition. For sure, there are flow voids, so you know you need to uh, start from there and try to add. Okay, thirty second pass. So, what is this lesion? Well, the problem of this lesion is that there are flow void, but uh, coming back to my slides, you see there are there is no mass here. So, flow void, yes, but no mass visible in any of the sequence. So, this is. Uh, there are too many vessels, but there are a lot of vessels also in hemangioma. There is proptosis, hemangioma can give proptosis, but there is no mass. Also, this child was worsening over time without the uh, fatty involuting phase. And this is a case that was treated as hemangioma with a significant delay in the diagnosis. And I would like to thank the family who gave me the permission to show this case to uh, you know, basically avoid that this mistake will be done again. So. Bottom line, this is an AVM. When you see no mass but flow voids, think to, uh, of a, uh, on an AVM, not an hemangioma. Uh, and this is extremely important because the AVM will worsen over time. And sometimes they are so small that even with an MRA or with a dynamic MRA post contrast, you will not see the nidus. So remember to consider AVM. Speak with your interventional colleagues. In these cases, consider a um, um, uh, angiography. Uh, remember that AVM, differently from the mangioma, despite they don't have a mass, they can be very, very aggressive. So this is a differential diagnosis that you must do, and you must be uh, able to do it fast. Another case with a lot of flow void. So this is an MRA. These are T2 sequences with fat saturation. So uh, look at this. Uh, uh, this is a, an, another neonate. As you can see, the brain is not myelinated. Um, and uh, again, ask yourself, what are the radiological characteristics? There, is, there are flow voids. What else? Look at the MRA. There are some vessels here. But um, uh, what about the shunt? Can we demonstrate the shunt? Or maybe the nidus is there. Uh, look at this prominent vessel here. So what's going on here? Think about what we have seen before in an hemangioma and an AVM and try to give the right answer again. The same four possibility. What's the diagnosis? Um, it's an infantile angioma, venous malformation, venolymphatic malformation, and AVM or AVM. Uh, you have 30 seconds from now. And again, try to understand what I told you before about the critical characteristic of AVM, hemangioma. And if you have encountered venous malformation, think this may be maybe a venous malformation or venolymphatic malformation. So think what you know about venous malformation and venolymphatic malformation. 
30 seconds past. So I can give you the answer. Is this infantile hemangioma, venous malformation, very lymphatic malformation, or AVM? But actually, uh, this came with the diagnosis of infantile hemangioma. This is actually not an infantile hemangioma. This was a congenital hemangioma of the forehead and the scalp, but they look exactly um, uh, the same. It's just clinically different. But the main thing I want to point out in this case that there is a mass. So if there is a mass, no matter how many vessels are there, this cannot be uh, an AVM. And look that there is no shunt with, with all this, uh, these vessels and a large vein, there is no shunt in particularly here, I pointed out the anterior surgical sinus. Um, so the MRA does not demonstrate shunt. The, the lesion is big enough uh, to be um, uh, uh, demonstrated with an MRA, um, proper to be studied with an MRA properly. So mass, yes, a lot of vessel, this is an hemangioma. So um, this is another lesion, again, in the orbit. And in this case, there will be no uh, question, but try to answer uh, again, what are the radiological characteristics? So look at this lesion here. What is that you see? What is the straight line between intensities that you see in post contrast T1 and in, T, uh, in T1, pre contrast and in T2? Also, if you compare pre and post contrast fat sat and non fat sat, as I say, the post contrast is the only T1 that should be fat saturated, apart from exception, you will see that there is no enhancement, but there are fluid fluid levels. So look at the pre T1 as well to make sure that there is no enantiomer. So what is characterized in the head and neck region and in the orbit, giving again proptosis by fluid fluid level, completely different management from AVM and from hemangioma? Well, this is an lymphatic malformation. So remember the radiological hallmark of lymphatic malformation are fluid fluid levels. So you see that we are adding, you know, mass, flow voids, fluid fluid level. We are adding key radiological feature to kind of find the right diagnosis. But remember one other thing that lymphatic malformation can be micro or mi macrocystic. So in this case, we have an example in the neck of very big cyst. In this case, another lymphatic malformation involving the orbital, um, the orbit, masticator space and subcutaneous soft tissue, but very small cyst. So this is a microcystic. And sometimes when we treat with sclerotherapy, the macrocystic became my the macrocystic sorry became micro uh, cystic so we have this uh, evolution um, that should not uh, um, fool you another lesion with fluid fluid level again uh, uh, involving the medial aspect of the right orbit. Again, with proptosis, you see how non-specific is the proptosis as, as a sign, and this is the CT. So remember that there are fluid fluid level, and this is really important to, you know, for the differential diagnosis. But remember also that in this case, the, lo the location is slightly different. It's not in the orbit, but it's centered here in the bone. So, what is this? Is an uh, hemorrhagic rhabdomyosarcoma. As we know, the rhabdomyosarcoma, um, rhabdomyosarcoma is a misnomer. I will show you some example, but they don't develop from the muscle most of the time uh, and can develop by the bone. Is a venous malformation, just um, uh, as I, you know, uh, characterized by, by, by um, uh, internal bleeding is a venolymphatic malformation because of fluid fluid level, or is it is an aneurysmal bone cyst just because it's centered in the bone. Again, you will have 30 seconds. So think about that. Uh, where is the lesion? What are the key radiological findings? Uh, what I showed you before about lymphatic malformation? Uh, and uh, if you think can be something different like an hemorrhagic rhabdomyosarcoma. Okay, 30 seconds just passed, and I can give you the answer. In this case, remember that the key radiological findings is fluid fluid level that is typical not only of a lymphatic or venal lymphatic malformation, but also aneurysmal bone cyst. And this was exactly an aneurysmal bone cyst because it was centered in the bone. And look how can look aggressive this lesion if we consider the bone only. 
Another case, uh, this is 14 months old boy with left protosis. And uh, look, uh, I, again, what are the characteristics of the lesion? First of all, in this case, there is a bit of enhancement. So we compare pre and post T1 where, is a bit of a, where there is a bit of enhancement. There are fluid fluid level as before uh, the, in, in cystic appearance, but also there is a large developmental venous anomaly in the brain. This is actually a, a lymphatic malformation with some enhancing level uh, elements. So a lymphatic malformation normally should not enhance because only the, the, the cystic wall shows thin enhancement. If you have some a solid area of enhancement associated with the lymphatic malformation, we call venolymphatic malformation. But this is just to show you that uh, they can be associated with developmental venous anomaly in the brain. So again, like before, look at the old picture, not only the, uh, the, the, the orbit. And this is also to show that there are mixed uh, vascular malformation, such as the venolymphatic malformation that contains venous element here and lymphatic elements that alone should not enhance. What are the characteristics of the venous malformation? Apart from the enhancement, uh, a lot of uh, you know, bright T2 signal, but there is this uh, uh, area of, of dark signal, which is not tubular as the flow void characterized by the you know, characteristic of hemangioma or ADM. In this case, is a dark spot, which is shadowing on ultrasound, that is a phlebolite. So when you see a phlebolite, remember this is the radiological hallmark together with the, the enhancement. So this is again a mass enhancement, but if you see phlebolite, you are dealing with a venous malformation. And this is an example of a venous malformation for uh, an amazing paper on our pediatric orbital lesion by um, Vacha and Dr. Robson uh, showing um, the phlebolites in the Orbit. So remember that this, uh, um, this lesion have flavorized, but also remember that they have variable enhancement. Now, if you read the books, they say the signal is more hyper intense than the hemangioma, but do not trust the T2 signal so much because there are so many parameters that can influence the T2 signal. So uh, just to show you this patchy enhancement that actually increases over time, typical venous malformation, very different from the homogeneous enhancement. So if you say, if you see a patchy enhancement changing a bit in the, from the first to the second um, uh, post-contest scan that you do, uh, and phlebolites, uh, think of venous malformation. And remember that you should trust contest more than T2 signal. Also remember that you can ask the clinician how the lesion look like, and the lesion of venous malformation will be bluish like that, and these are the main differences. Very beautiful book by Bonifazio about differential diagnosis in pediatric dermatology. And the hemangioma um, is most of the time uh, not present at birth, just after birth, increases and then uh, uh, decreases over time. The venous malformation slowly grows and is present as, uh, um, at birth. So again, ask your clinician how the lesion look like. And use the right nomenclature. Remember then lymphatic malformation, venous malformation, venal lymphatic malformation, ADM are uh, vascular malformation, while the hemangioma, infantile or congenital, look very similar on imaging, are vascular tumor. So remember this description. And if I can suggest, read this beautiful paper by uh, Deborah Schatzkes. Um, that uh, um, he, uh, describe the classification and nomenclature of vascular anomaly. And this is also from, uh, from Deborah, uh, who borrowed me these slides, uh, where he, she showed basically that the, AV, the AVM does not have mass, but can give you bony lysis and uh, grows, um, uh, grows over time. And uh, uh, the hemangioma is characterized by large vessel at least in the first phases, while the venous malformation has this dynamic enhancement with phlebolites. And if you want to use the T2, remember venous malformation a bit too, is more T2 hyper intense uh, than an hemangioma. The lymphatic malformation that can have also a venal lymphatic mixed mix component can be macro and microcystic, and they have this fluid fluid level. When you see fluid fluid level, the only other differential diagnosis is the um, aneurysmal bone cyst. Now I want to show you some interorbital extraocular masses. The first thing to know is that you need to focus on 
malignant features. So you need to be able to identify where there are malignant features. And this is a question for you. Then we call girl with this very aggressive or looking aggressive mass. How we are sure that it's aggressive? Well, diffusion restriction and metastatic nodes. But again, another teaching point, do not stop looking, guys. You need to see everything else in the field of view. And in this case, there is a, a mass in the brain, supravermian mass. Now, this is interesting because if this was an adult, uh, this could not be in a tumor or at least not an aggressive tumor because there is no enhancement whatsoever. But in a child can be everything, including a tumor. And look at the diffusion restriction here that in intracranial masses should be always regarded as the most important um, um, key finding for the differential diagnosis. So my question for you is that you have this combination of orbital aggressive lesion and something restricting but not enhancing in the brain. What is that? It's a metastatic neuroblastoma. It's a rhabdomyosarcoma due to Pax7 fusion with brain and nodal metastasis. It's a smart B1 mutation with two synchronous lesion or a typical tuberculosis. You have again a 30 second. So what is this combination of findings? What does um, uh, it suggest you? And this is a case that I love showing in all my presentation because it taught me a lot. And it's actually uh, a case where we can see two things together and do both histological and molecular diagnosis. 30 seconds just passed. I'm looking at the clock and uh, the answer is, this is an ATRT with synchronous orbital rhabdoid tumor due to smart b one mutation. So it's not a rhabdomyosarcoma, it's another aggressive tumor called rhabdoid malignant tumor, but the combination of these two um, the masses are associated with a mutation, a germline mutation that gives you embryonal tumor in the brain and outside the brain. And just my teaching point, remember that embryonal tumor uh, in the, the brain can also have a la complete lack of enhancement and they show, uh, but they always will show diffusion restriction. So intracranially trust restriction first. Um, and also um, uh, remember that ATRT, meduloblastoma and, and uh, ATMR, so embryonal tumor with multilayer rosette are the main embryonal tumor that you find in the child, child brain. Speaking about the other aggressive tumor that I mentioned, the rhabdomyosarcoma, again, aggressive behavior with bone erosion, invasion, and so on, uh, and non-homogeneous appearances. This is rhabdomyosarcoma in the masticator space. Uh, just uh, there are several publications also about rhabdomyosarcoma in the eye saying that the fusion restriction helps. But my personal experience tells me that it helps much less than in cases of uh, um, intracranial tumor, when diffusion restriction means everything. Uh, the difference between an, a very aggressive embryonal tumor and uh, uh, a non-aggressive astrocytic tumor, for instance. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the classic example. You see very heterogeneous uh, mass that destroy uh, the, 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 um, the muscles and the bone with some hyperintensity in DWI, petty G, um, uh, hypercaptation, fine. But so radiologically aggressive in the masticator space, we think of a rhabdomyosarcoma, but look at this lesion in this boy with uh, a left proptosis. So uh, the lesion has um, T2 hyperintense signal. There's also localization here in the uh, extraorbital muscle. Uh, it enhances, in this case, they didn't fat saturate. Uh, and look at the diffusion though. The, the, there are some areas of reduced diffusivity uh, a lot of shine through. So this hyperintensity, very similar to what I show you here, uh, but uh, um, uh, in just a bit of bony reaction, so not frank destruction. So what is that? What's going on in this case? Is this an hemangioma? Is this a rhabdomyosarcoma? I asked myself the same question, and actually uh, this, uh, I thought it was mainly a rhabdomyosarcoma because I had the CT and because this was this, uh, um, um, aggressive feature on the bone, but I put hemangioma in the differential because of the diffusion. So my teaching point is that you can use the diffusion, you must perform a diffusion even in the neck, but uh, it's, it's much less reliable than in the differential diagnosis of brain tumor. Very, very important point. So these are the two cases I show you 
very similar appearance and diffusion. This one is an hemangioma, another is a rhabdomyosarcoma. Another important point, look at this lesion involving the orbital bone and also the skull base and also the vertex, but also with an hemorrhagic lesion in the right orbit. So my question for you, and uh, there is no pool in this case, but just you can type in is, uh, what do we do next? Uh, this is an infant with masses in the skull, in the orbital um, uh, bones and skull base, plus an hemorrhagic mass in the, uh, in the um, uh, globe. So what we do in this case? Uh, do by we, we do a biopsy. This is these are restricting masses. We do a CT in an infant. If you see aggressive masses in the skull and skull base, with or without orbital localization, you do an ultrasound of the abdomen because this is typical localization of metastatic neuroblastoma. And this was the ultrasound, and this is the middle of the neuroblastoma on MR. So very, very important for you. Uh, and also remember that the, the metastatic neuroblastoma will erode the bone in comparison to something that can look similar on MR, but has a typical ground glass appearance and is the fibrous dysplasia on CT. So if you have the CT, use as well that. But remember, skull base, uh, uh, um, uh, aggressive lesions, uh, skull vault aggressive lesion in an infant, uh, uh, these are suggestive of metastatic neuroblastoma. Another case for you in the last five minutes, uh, this is a fatal case, uh, uh, courtesy of Dr. Kelly Pecoretti from UCL. You see this very large cystic-like lesion pushing the, the, the globe uh, anteriorly. And this is the prenatal scan. This is the 3D uh, reformat of the scan. And this is the postnatal scan. This I did the scan and I did an exception to my rule. We have a post contrast here, fat saturated images showing some areas of contrast. And we have pre-contrast non-fat saturated images and also I added a pre-contest fat saturated because I wanted to know better what was going on in this child. So my question for you with this appearance prenatally, with this area of hyperintensity in the um, pre-contrasty one, what is the diagnosis? Is this a retinoblastoma? Is a lymphatic malformation? Is a teratoma? or is a congenital complex variant of ocular cyst? 30 seconds to answer. So remember, it's an enhancing complex mass that we saw with cystic appearance prenatally that evolved over time with an area of spontaneous hyperintensity in pre-contrast T1 non-fat saturated. Other 10 seconds. And this was a teratoma. And ter teratoma typically in the anterior neck, but can involve also the orbit. And when you see mixed cystic and solid mass with fat and calcium, uh, um, you need to think at, uh, to, um, of a teratoma, especially a congenital. The lymphatic malformation will not have fat and will not have solid enhancement apart from few area of faint enhancement in case of venal lymphatic malformation. Because there, it's not really in the differential, Remember, it can arise from the thyroid gland. And this is another um, uh, mass creating proptosis, but this is, of course, the last of its, of its problem. And you can see that there are areas of spontaneous hyperintensity in the T1 pre. So look at the T1 pre. And before, as I show you here, I basically use the T1 uh, pre with and without fat saturation to confirm that this was, in fact, fat and not blood. Um, and so look at the T1 event intensity of the fat and think about the teratoma when, when large mixed solidocystic mass are found in a neonate. And this is, of course, uh, just to show how big and uh, life-threatening this mass can be. L last uh, a few minutes, just uh, intraocular mass, start from the clinical finding. This is a 22-month girl with leukocoria. And look, first of all, at this mass and the internal characteristic of this mass, but also the fact that we use a different protocol in this specific case. We, we did a, a high resolution T2 cis, parasagittal T1 post uh, that are specific sequences to look for 
the uh, uh, cranial nerve, uh, optic nerve invasion. So play a bit with your sequences because this can be very helpful. But also in this case, we have SWI showing blooming and again, like before, a mass in the brain. So what's going on in this case? What is the diagnosis? Is a retinoblastoma, lymphatic malformation, teratoma, or a congenital ocular cyst. So same for um, uh, option than before. And again, you will have 30 seconds. We are almost at the end of our uh, 30 minutes. Try to answer as fast as possible. Okay, so what was this mass? Well, with this characteristic, especially with the blooming in a neonate with leucocoria and an ansic mass in the globe, with also a, um, a, a lesion in the brain is typical of a retinoblastoma. So enhancing lesion uh, in the, with calcification uh, in a normal size eye are typical of a, a retinoblastoma. And in this case, remember that there are non-calcified mass like the Cox disease in this case with this lipoproteinaceous hyperintense subretinal exudate and you see this tent like appearance but also persistent hyperplastic primi uh, primitive vitreous with this martini glass sign and um, um, retinopathy of prematurity uh, with uh, basically this um, uh, that can be enhancement and this dystrophic appearance of the globe the important thing is that all of these do not have calcification unless they are in advanced phase. And the diagnosis is often uh, made uh, by the ophthalmologist. Also very important that the retinoblastoma can have this intracranial localization uh, in the pineal region, uh, especially in children with a, um, a germline mutation. So, in conclusion, you have vascular malformation, vascular tumor, you need to use the right nomenclature, look for mass, look for enhancement, and key radiological findings like uh, uh, the, the fluid fluid level and internal provoid. Look for the aggressive uh, radiological feature in the intraorbital extraocular mass, and remember the differential diagnosis of retinoblastoma, with, which includes the other causes of leucocoria. Uh, these are the people I would like to thank. And again, I'm on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, if you have any question, I would be very happy to um, answer uh, them. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, um, thank you again for the invitation.